All right, so our second part of our second day <laughs> starts now with uh, Silvia Seminara from the University of Buenos Aires, uh, from the School of Engineering. Uh, she will talk about anomalous diffusion with Caputo Fabricio, uh, time derivative and inverse problem. So Silvia, if you can share. Thank you. Well, you can see it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, my name is Silvia Seminara. We did this work with Marine Stoparevsky and Marcela Fabio and Guillermo Lamura. And Marcelo, Marcela and Guillermo from the University of San Martin. It's about anomalous diffusion with Caputo Fabricio time derivative and inverse problem. We call diffusion when uh, we talk about the movement of particles from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration until the equilibrium is reached. From conservation of mass and Fick's law, we have the classical diffusion equation to model the way in which the concentration of particles varies in position and time in an homogeneous medium. If we have a source of particles in Camion, we have this equation. It's a parabolic equation with uh, an ordinary uh, derivative of in time and the Laplacian in uh, the spatial part. Here, U is the concentration of particles, K is the diffusion coefficient, and S is the source. From this mathematical model, we have that the mean square displacement of particles is proportional to the time. But if we have an inhomogeneous media, we call it anomalous diffusion, and the displacement of the particles is not proportional to the time, but to a fractional power of time. Uh, for model this situation, we use fractional differential equation like this. Here, the, the ordinary time uh, derivative is replaced by the fractional uh, time derivative. And uh, with uh, the order of, of derivation between zero and one, we have a phenomenon of, of subdiffusion between one and two, we have a phenomenon of super diffusion. And if alpha is one, we have the classical diffusion. We have several definitions for the fractional derivative from Riemann Liouville's, Caputo's, Antagara Malianus, Caputo Fabricius. These derivatives all have the are integral operators that have a sort of memory that take into account the past history of the function. The kernels have different regularity properties. Well, uh, about uh, this derivative, there is a very rich theory parallel to the classical one. We have many practical and satisfactory applications in physics, chemistry, biology, etc existence and uniqueness theorems, inverse operators, maximal principles, and effective numerical methods, uh, both for ODIS and PDE with this type of derivatives. We will consider Caputo Fabricio fractional derivative. For a function in a subvolume space, the Caputo Fabricio derivative for uh, an order between zero and one, is an integral operator with a regular kernel here. Here we have, uh, well, the interval of integration. M is a normalizing factor with this property. And we have um, this detail. The derivative in, the, in T, uh, equal to a is zero. So this condition, the, the problems we can uh, solve with this derivative. 
Well, um, we uh, chose the Caputo Fabricio fractional derivative to describe a subdiffusion phenomenon. Here is the problem. We have the subdiffusion equation with the source and the, the border condition here. Uh, we are interested in an inverse problem. We, can, we want to find uh, the source S and of course the concentration of particles. And the data are information about the source and other information that data we will see. Well, we consider a, a problem in one dimension. Here we have um, the problem, the, the, the formula of the, of the diffusion equation, and the, the source is a separable one, uh, a, a, fun, a function about uh, of x and a function about that. Uh, the derivative have a sort of memory, you see. Well, uh, we have the separable source, Sx, Ht. And the, the part of the time we suppose we know, and we have uh, interest in recovering S of X. Well, um, we have, uh, we, we need some additional that data, and uh, we decided to measure the concentration in some points of the interval. Um, well, suppose we can separate variables, like in the classical uh, problem. Here we have the Fourier uh, series for U, the concentration. UK are the Fourier coefficients. Uh, note that as uh, U is C2, we have that the second derivative is continuous and the fractional derivative is continuous too. So this one is, uh, this, this one are the, the coefficients of the second derivative and these one are the coefficients of the fractional derivative, the Fourier coefficient. So uh, assuming we have this series uh, absolutely convergent, we have the following uh, equation for the coefficients of u, k, of u. Mm -hmm. This is a fractional uh, equation. Uh, we are going to solve this to uh, obtain the coefficients for A. SK are the Fourier coefficients of SX. Well, first we will solve two basic problems. The first one is very simple. It is nothing but uh, looking for the inverse operator, operator of the fractional derivative. Uh, we, we suppose S is unknown and uh, W and F0 are known. So uh, this is the definition of the fractional derivative and uh, step by step we obtain the explicit formula for the inverse operator. Uh, sorry. Uh, observe that the inverse operator or the, of the fractional derivative is um, an average between the function and the integral of the, fun of the function. The second problem is this. We can uh, we can get an equivalent ordinary problem simply by inverting the fractional derivative. Note that as the derivative is zero when t is zero, 
we have a compatibility condition uh, between F and G. So replacing W by G uh, minus lambda F and applying the explicit formula from problem one, we can obtain then step by step This is the ordinary equivalent problem and the explicit solution. This explicit solution we will use to obtain the, the Fourier coefficients for UK we need to solve the problem of anomalous diffusion. Note that this second problem with J uh, equals zero is like looking for the game values and eigenvectors vectors of the uh, fractional derivative, but it have no eigen functions because the equivalent ordinary problem uh, had only the trivial solution. Well, we have this pending problem to obtain the Fourier coefficients of U. Here we have the coefficient of, of s we have to recover. Uh, using the formula, the explicit formula, we obtain use k. And well, if this formula holds, we can uh, demonstrate that the, <clears throat> the series is absolutely convergent because we can uh, find that it is minus than the product of two series that are bounded here. Well, we choose um, to select additional dat data that are the measures of the concentration at some points, x1, x2, xm in the interval. So here we have the measurements and here the explicit formula. And from these, we can pose um, a linear system where the matrix is composed by this data. Uh, here N is the highest level of Fourier series we have to, we, we need to, to obtain or we decided to obtain. And in, well, we have to say that the more to the coefficient we can evaluate, the better the approximation of x of Sx we get. But for reasons of computation economy, economy, if the difference between two approximations is uh, small enough, we can stop the process. We can decide to stop the process. Uh, well, uh, we chose examples of increasing difficulty with no solution, U, uh, to test how the, the procedure is performed. Um, well, we introduced uh, noise in the data. Uh, we simulated uh, measurements of concentration uh, with the normal distribution and uh, a sort of error uh, with 1% uh, of variance. In our example, uh, the normal normalization factor is one. Well, the first example is this one. Alpha is uh, 0.5. And uh, well, the H is uh, known is T square. Uh, S, uh, Sx is uh, with only one frequency, sinus uh, 5 uh, P, Px. This is the exact uh, solution. We consider M and N uh, equals 6, obtaining the matrix that was in vertical, simulated the noise in measure values and obtain the coefficient. This is the 
the accordance between the exact function and the approximation. Uh, the result is very good. This is the concentration in red, sorry, in red the exact concentration and in green the approximation is very good too. And here we have uh, a detail uh, after various uh, simulations, the, the, the approximation was very good. Uh, we calculated the quadratic error here, and it was uh, for 50 simulations between 2% and 0.7%. The example two, uh, age was uh, this function, S uh, was with three frequencies. The exact formula, this is the, the exact concentration. Uh, we performed uh, 14 sets of simulations. Uh, for each uh, simulation, we a performance uh, 50 repetition of the experiment with noisy data data and we obtained the correct coefficients and uh, contracted the uh, approximation of the source uh, after that we uh, obtained the a mean value for s and if we, if for each pair of consecutive approximations, we um, obtained a, a difference, a quadratic difference between one approximation and the other to decide if the error is small enough to stop the process. Here we have the difference between simulations, and we, we observe that between five uh coefficients we have this the smallest difference so we decided that our solution was about this uh, quantity of uh, terms this is the condition number of the matrix of the matrix that uh, you see it is increasing when we uh, get more and more points of measurement well, the smaller distance was between uh, approximation about five terms of the series. The quadratic error, where these for six uh, terms and this one for, uh, for uh, sorry, these for five terms and these for six terms. So the, the best approximation was about six terms of the Fourier series. This one is uh, for in red the the approximation. Uh, sorry, in red the, the the exact solution and in green the approximation. Uh, it's very good. The approximation is very good. This is for six terms. Five terms is better. Well, the condition number of the matrix increases as we uh, use uh, more sorry <laughs> well as the uh, as the number of um, of uh, measurement points grows the condition number of the matrix increases so in the general case there is uh, we need a trade off mat uh, between the number of measurements and the number of the condition number or the matrix of the matrix. Sorry. So we observe that by changing the position of the points, the condition number of the matrix can be improved. An optimization procedure could be implemented to determine the proper number and position of measurement points so that the solution is better. Well, conclusion, uh, we propose an approximation scheme to find the solution of the partial component of the SARS in an homogeneous fractional diffusion equation of one dimension from measurements of the concentration at some points. 
we separate variables and arrive to a simple fractional differential equation that can be solved explicitly. The numerical examples show that the, the procedure have a good performance, but uh, well, with few coefficients of uh, the Fourier series. And we need a detailed analysis of the properties of the method regarding the stability, the structure of the matrix, and the appropriate choice of position of measurement points, because uh, well, we can uh, better the condition number of the matrix. Well, this is the bibliography. Uh, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Silvia. Well, uh, any questions? While people think about questions, I have one question. <laughs> uh, can you tell, uh, so you are, um, the source is, uh, you're considering the separable case. Uh, I mean, can you comment on that, like in which case or, I mean, if I want to think about an application or something, um, I don't know, can you say something? Because then you, you took very specific one, right? This T square, then the hyperbolic star yes, sign. Yes, well, um, we have read some by, uh, bibliography and they choose separable stars because I think it is very difficult to consider a, a function, a different function. So, we we know no practical examples. We uh, we are we are no uh, engineers or physics. So uh, we based in the bi biography we saw, and every source is taken separable. I imagine it is very difficult to use a source without separating the variables. Mm. Okay. Yes. I have no practical uh, explanation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Me neither. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thanks. Uh, any other question? We have time. Plenty of time. Well, right. thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We can start with introductions. <laughs> Continue with introductions. All right. So our next speaker is Fernando Otero from uh, Universidad Nacional de Mar del Plata. He will talk about combination of CEM and light scattering data for the inverse estimation of particle size, size distribution using a Bayesian approach. Can anyone see? Mm, no. Todavía no. Yeah. No. No. No? No. No. Now, now. Okay. Well, uh, this is Fernando. Um, I'm a member of the Department of Mathematics at the Faculty of Engineering, Universidad Nacional de Mar del Plata, and also a member of the Research Institute of Materials Science and Technology in Tema, which belongs to CONICET and Universidad Nacional de Mar del Plata. Here's the talk outline. I'm going to start with the application problem. Well, our application problem is to characterize um, particle systems, which can be done through the particle size distribution, which defines some material properties. The PSD, as I will name it from now on, uh, can be obtained from different experimental type, uh, techniques. In particular, optical techniques are suitable to perform non-destructive tests of materials. 
One example of this is the static light scattering or SLS from now on. Uh, this is the experimental thing we are using. And we are dealing with polymeric emulsion formed by spherical particles. So, uh, there are different types of measurements of the PSD. And no single technique can provide us from the complete description of the PSD. So, this is one motivation on combining some of them. One division of the methodologies can be in direct methods, such as the scanning electron microscopy, SEM, from now on. And as the one I was telling you before, the static light scattering or SLS. Have some advantages and disadvantages. The method, you can see directly the PSD like that. You can see the particles in the micrograph. And the indirect method, you sh in, in this case, in the SLS case, you have to solve an inverse problem, which is ill condition. Just to take a look, we have a micrograph from SEM and we have a, a scattering spectra in the case of SLS, which is in function of the scattering vector Q. So here is, here is a plus. We try to combine limbs, this, and from some data analysis and inverse problem, we have to, we want to recover a particle size distribution. So we decide the particle size distribution and we measure the scatter light spectrum. We need to relate them through a model. But first, I show you some of the equipment, experimental equipment we have at Intema, the flat cell static light scattering on the right, and a brief scheme on, on the left, where uh, you can see how the light scattering can be uh, understood. An incident laser beam through the particle system, and at different angles, we have detectors which measures, which records the intensity. So we have uh, many models, uh, but I'm just going to show you just a little bit because the, the presentation is long. So we have some uh, parameters like the scattering vector Q I mentioned before, the, refractive, the relative refractive index M, the incident wave lambda, and we can we have uh, we will name the particle size distribution f of r. So we have three models, basic models: the one due to me, the one due to Peterson, and the one due to Fry. We are dealing mostly with the two below. The one due to Peterson is an approximate model for low contrast concentrated particle systems. We are dealing. And the do one due to Fry is an analytical model for the same type of particle systems. We are dealing with this, and in particular with Peterson, because this is an approximate model we can use in practice. Uh, all these models belong to the Rayleigh de Vigan theory. I'm not I'm not stopping here. If anyone has any questions, we can uh, I can answer after the presentation. Just to say a little bit about the Peterson model of local monodisper approximation model, which is the original name. Well, we have the measurements, which are uh, expressed as an integral equation with parameters k, in global constant, the f of r, which is the PSD, and, and two factors, the structure factor and the form factor, where there is also an unknown, which is the following fraction effective parameter p, I mentioned. Or, or perhaps I forget. Well, then the Fry model is very complex. I'm not going to stop here. I'm going to skip this part. And I'm going to just go just to the inverse analysis. Well, we're interested in finding the posterior distribution for F or the PSD. That is the distribution of S given the static light scattering measurements. So applying Bayes theorem, you can uh, see as this equation, where this is the prior density, this is the likelihood term, where, where we assume uh, normal measurements, and we have the density of the measurements, which can be computed through numerical integ integration. 
but can be computationally expensive for high dimensional problems. So MCMC methods have been proposed. In particular, we are using Metropolis Hastings because it's an algorithm which is uh, very simple in its implementation, although it has some problem with the, um, their own parameter settings. In particular, the problem of Bayesian estimation of the PSD was considered in two forms. First, uh, we consider a, parameter, a parameterized family of distributions to represent the PSD in the fixed form scheme, and then with no assumptions on the shape of the PSD, that is the free form scheme. Let's start with the first one. I'm gonna skip this part of the Metropolis Hastings. If anyone is interested, if in particular in this algorithm, we can see after the presentation. So the fixed form scheme, as you know, we're, for every inverse problem, we need regularization. This is achieved, in this case, representing the PSD by a family of distributions. We use log normal distribution in this case, with this formula, with parameters g and r sub zero, but instead, we, through some transforms, we can uh, go to the mean radius and the PSD standard deviation sigma, which are the actual parameters we are going to use. So, applying once again Bayes theorem, now for capital P set of parameters, we have the mean radius, sigma, P and K. In this case, we are going to use non-informative prior for P and K and the prior information obtained from SEM measurements for the mean radius and sigma. With all that, the problem results into non-linear parameter estimation. Just to show you, from SEM data, we build prior distributions, a histogram, and we interpolate by a log normal distribution. And we approximate normal distribution for sigma and for the mean radius using the number of particles of these micrographs and the sample variance, S squared. This is rough approximation, but uh, as we can, we have uh, studied later, uh, it was pretty good. So, in the freeform scheme, we take advantage of the model structure as I showed you before, the integral equation, if you remember. And we define an iterative method applying Bayes theorem in this form. Well, we have now that the F is given, the SLS measurements and the parameter P. Now, this prior, which is the prior F given P, takes account of both prior and regularization. The prior information, is in this one, the prior of F, which is prior information from SEM in terms of mean radius and the PSD standard deviation sigma. And we all we have another term with this kind of a smoothing term, which has a number of components here of the discrete, discretized PSD. Now, uh, you can show that uh, you can see that the PSD is decretizing in R in the domain of the radius. And we have a, a regularization matrix H, an adjustable regularization parameter gamma to do that. So, in the freeform scheme, we use the iterative method uh, and we have to follow these steps. First, I choose the value for a parameter P compute a value for gamma using some method, such as typical uh, regularization methods like generalized cross validation, LQ, or principal discrepancy. We estimate now F star, because if you remember the integral equation, the K is absorbed by F, and we apply then the metropolis casting algorithm. We repeat the first three steps for the whole range of possible values of P, and we select the PSD with the maximum product of the numerator of the base theorem here. So, now with implementation, we develop a MATLAB program where the metropolis hasting algorithm was implemented. Different algorithm parameters were analyzed in order to determine an optimal estimation for the simulated cases. cases. Those parameters were the initial sample, the prior information, the acceptance ratio, 
the candidate generating density and the length of the generated chain. Let's start with the initial sample. Well, uh, we must uh, determine if the initial sample is essential to uh, differ to obtain differ different chains and uh, final. So we sh we see that the free form scheme show a high sensitivity to the initial sample due to a multiple local minima problem. As a solution, we include the simulated annealing algorithm into the MH algorithm. How, how, uh, how we done this? Well, I can show you after the presentation. The idea is to reach the maximum a posteriori solution with this modification and use it as an initial sample with the MH algorithm in its original form. The prior information, as I showed you before, is from, from SEM measurements that were considered in simulation for a range of typical number of particles between 50 and 200. The acceptance ratio is the percentage of times a new sample is accepted. Best results show that the acceptance ratio should be set between 0 0.23 and 0 0.33. That is in agreement with previous works. The candidate generating density in this case is the so-called random walk and it has some problem because it updates at one parameter at a time. I'll show you later that. And we have the length of the generated chain. That, mean that, that must be large enough to be a good approximation to the final distribution. Until reach a stationary regime, uh, which um, samples should be discarded. In this case, we use final chains of 200,000 samples and 300,000 samples, respectively, for the fit form and the free form schemes. Another implementation issues were found in the free form scheme, the discretization of the PSD. As I was telling you, the random walk is very slow and has conversion problems if there is a huge number of components of the PSD. It was considered a maximum number of points in the PSD that was 40. The regularization matrix age, well, the, uh, we try with a few regularization matrices. We show, we obtain, sorry, the best results in simulations for matrix corresponding to a second derivative order. And computation of the regularization parameter, we try with generalized cross-validation, principle of discrepancy, and the LQ. Well, finally, after all simulations, the principle of discrepancy seem, bring, seem to bring an intermediate, intermediate, intermediate solution for simulated cases, and it was used for experimental examples. However, this method requires an estimation of the noise level. What experience have we learned from simulation? Well, in the case of SLS data, in the first part, where p model models were, were used, was used for both forward and inverse problem, some parameter correlation and conversion problems were, fine, were found. So we set MH parameters and we correct this part. And we have some normalization, renormalization of the parameters also. In the second part, with the most accurate model, the Fry's model was used for forward and then Peterson's model used for inverse problem. We must include modeling errors in order to obtain uh, acceptable uh, results. For the case of SEM data, we use Monte Carlo simulations to analyze the statistical, to obtain the statistical analysis of SEM samples and to build some MC tool for assessing the quality of priors. Well, in the case of combination of SS data and SEM data, we use the informative priors to solve conversion problems. We have to divide it into cases. The first one for diluted and low concentrated systems. Peterson's model approximates, in these cases, well, price model. So in these cases, a great improvement in prior SEM confidence intervals were achieved. So poor influence of prior simulations on results. For concentrated system, fright model is, was used for forward problem, 
we need to include modeling errors and as a consequence, a major influence of prior information or results were uh, found. How do we include the modeling errors? Well, uh, in the case of concentrated system, these modeling errors cannot be neglected. So we add, in, we add another term to the standard deviation in the normal noise. This term corresponds to an error represented by a Gaussian process interpolated over each value of measure Q between the intensity generating from both models. This can be so this, this can be seen as a new and large variance in the in the measurements. So finally the result for experimental examples. We try with blends of polyisobutylene label PAV5 and PAV025 within in isobornil metacrylate. Well, the results from applying from applying the Bayesian methodology are much more consistent with SEM estimation, as you can saw before. That it improved previous overestimates in mean radius and obtained slightly but reasonably wider variances of the PSD. Maximum a posteriori distribution obtained by both fixed and free-form scheme are similar and the corresponding data fittings, data fittings are quite acceptable. Just to take a look at one example, this one for example, 50 PAV25 replica, you can see the SEM estimations are have a mean radius of about 0.19 and the least squares without Bayesian approach is 0.33 about. So there was some difference, but when using the Bayesian approach, the fixed point, we have 0 0.19, 20, uh, 19, 15 and 0 0.1966 with the freeform scheme. Also the maxima posteriori were more similar. Also, you can see that in the uh, graphical of the PSD uh, recover. The blue is the Bayesian free form scheme, the green is the Bayesian fixed form scheme, and the red is the least squared base method. You can see that also graphically. And finally, you can see that data, fit, data fittings were acceptable in all cases. We don't lose so much uh, data fitting by doing this. So, as a conclusion, the Bayesian methodology was successfully applied using two different schemes, combining, combining data from two different experimental techniques. And this methodology is especially recommended where reliable information is available and approximate models are used. Well, that's all. Thank you to everyone. Thank you, Fernando. Uh, any questions? Preguntas para Fernando. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Oh, Fernando, nice to see you. Mucho gusto. Hola. Uh, uh, very nice presentation, Fernando. And, uh, uh, Thank you. I, I actually I have a comment. It's not a question that uh, you, mm -hmm. you mentioned that you have used the uh, uh, like the L curve or the generalized uh, mm -hmm. uh, okay. cross validation for 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 obtaining the regularization parameter. Mm -hmm. But but you can include the the regularization parameter as a hyperparameter in the in the Bayesian and use a prior for this parameter. Mm -hmm. you know? So it's actually estimated as part of the of the solution of the problem. Uh, did you try this or? No? Yes, I I try I try the LQ. Uh, um, uh, the LQ uh, here, here it is. Uh, 
LQ, in this case, produces over-regularization on the solution. No, no what, what, what I mean is that uh, uh, you, you can use uh, the, you can consider the regularization mm -hmm. parameter as a hyperparameter. Ah, okay, prior, yes, I, I understand. No, yes, yes, I, I, no, no, I haven't considered that option of considering uh -huh. in, in hyperparameter. No, no, no. Uh -huh. Because this, uh, uh, sometimes it works very well. Okay. You, you can try. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice to see you, Fernando. Abraço. Thank you. Uh, nice to see you too. <laughs> Any other question or comment? Everything is welcome. Well, if there is no questions, uh, let's uh, thank Fernando again. Claps. Mm -hmm. Thank <laughs> you. Claps. Um, so I will propose, I will speak Spanish just for a second. Pero iba a proponer que María Belén es, Belén? Um, María... Eh, María uh, Beatriz. Beatriz. Ah. Sí. <laughs> um, Vos tenés el video, un video ya listo. Sí, sí. Eh, ¿Por qué? En lugar de esperar, ¿qué les parece si seguimos? Este, todos, salen, todos, este, todos esos problemas que plantean esos papers salen de, de problemas físicos. Que soy sincera, no los entiendo. Cuando hablan de la fuente, de un problema de transmisión de calor, yo no, no entiendo lo que es esa fuente, pero sé que es importante encontrarla y que no se conoce. Bueno, y todos los problemas este, que yo he visto utilizan eh, el método de diferencias finitas. ¿no? Entonces, este, bueno, yo trato de resolverlo, por eso dije en el, al comienzo del video que mi intención no es ver que mi método es mejor que el método de diferencias finitas, que da una forma más exacta, no. Quiero solamente mostrar que se puede abarcar desde ese otro punto de vista. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Bien. ¿Puedo preguntar algo? Sí. sí. Eh, pero, ¿encontrás eh, diferencia entre las soluciones? O sea, eh, ¿la podés contar? Eh, en, en muchos ejemplos que yo he visto en los, en los papers, eh, eh, son muy teóricos. Son muy teóricos. Este, por ahí este, no hay ejemplos. No hay ejemplos como para que yo compare... En otros sí, en otros sí, y a veces este, eh, la, el error que, que miden es diferente al error que estoy midiendo yo. Yo estoy midiendo la norma L2 de la diferencia de la aproximación con la función verdadera. ¿Eh? Y, y, el, y en otros trabajos que yo he visto, que por ejemplo aplican método, este, el método de diferencias finitas, eh, y tienen ejemplos, usan otro, otra, otra medida para medir el error. Así que no, no es muy comparable. Pero en general todos tienen muy pocos ejemplos este, concretos, muy pocos ejemplos numéricos. ¿Mm? Son más teóricos, por lo menos los que yo he visto. Gracias. Bueno, gracias. <ríe> Muchas gracias. Bueno. Eh, no sé cómo hicieron, eh, yeah, how you did the yesterday eh, for the networking. ¿Hicieron algo? ¿Cómo lo organizaron el networking ayer? Me lo perdí. No, nos presentamos y charlamos un poco qué hacía cada uno, cosa que ya hicimos acá, uh -huh. pero si alguien, eso hicimos ayer. Los que estábamos presentes, que no, no somos exactamente los mismos, ¿no, Mariela? No, no, pero estaba pensando que Silvia y María Beatriz se presentaron, uh -huh. y también Rosa y mí, Rafael, no sé. Rafael Carvalho. Pero... 
por ahí es el único que no se presentó, ¿no? No sé si quiere hablar. Good night to everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Professor Elso, uh, doctor student, and we worked together uh, since graduation. 